Good morning. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the transcatheter aortic valve replacement or the TAVAR procedure. So this is a procedure where we do an aortic valve replacement through a catheter approach. The native aortic valve remains and is displaced by the new valve implantation. Once in place, the new prosthetic valve begins to function, and it's indicated for use in those with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis that's due to senile degenerative calcification of the aortic valve. So this is what this looks like. There's a prog progressive calcification and thickening that results in stiff valve leaflets that don't move easily or open fully. Now, a normal aortic valve area is three to four centimeters square, and it, you're considered to have severe aortic stenosis when your valve area is at or less than one, and it's considered to be critical aortic stenosis when your valve area is at or less than 0.7 centimeters squared. So the classic symptoms of aortic stenosis are angina, syncope, and heart failure. Uh, with the onset of dyspnea and other heart failure symptoms, this foretells the worst outlook. And if you see, this is like a, a survival curve here. There's this latent period. And then once you have the onset of symptoms, you see a very rapid decline in survival. So what was the rationale for developing this procedure? Surgical aortic valve replacement is the gold standard treatment for aortic stenosis. We know that it reduces symptoms and improves survival. However, there are a large number of patients that present a high or prohibitive risk for surgical replacement. And it was found that in clinical practice, more than 30% of patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis were not undergoing surgical replacement. Mortality is about 50% within the first two years once symptoms present. And so treating this group of patients with a safe and effective, minimally invasive catheter procedure has been a really promising alternative for these patients. We know that the benefits of the TAVAR are a reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and repeat hospitalizations. And we see improvement in their mean gradient and valve area, their New York Heart Association functional class, six-minute walk test, and most importantly, in their quality of life. There are potential adverse events with this procedure, stroke, conduction disturbance and need for a pacemaker, and this is especially true with the Medtronic core valve device, vascular and bleeding complications, MI, dysfunction of the valve or paravalvular leaking, uh, urgent need for surgery, thrombosis, perforation leading to tamponade, infection, and death. These are the two currently available valves, the Edward Sapien transcatheter heart valve and the Medtronic core valve system. So what are the differences between these valves? The Edward Sapien valve is the valve that was used in the partner study. It is currently FDA approved for commercial use in patients that are considered to be a high or extreme risk for surgical valve replacement. It's balloon expandable on a stainless steel frame with bovine pericardial tissue. There are currently two commercially available valve sizes, the 23 and 26 millimeter, and this accommodates a native aortic valve annulus that's 18 to 25 millimeters. The sheath size is 22 or 24 French, and the access is iliofemoral, transapical, or a direct aortic approach. The Medtronic core valve is the device used in the core valve US pivotal trial. We currently have FDA approval for commercial use with this device in extreme risk patients. We are anxiously awaiting this approval for the high risk population, and we do still have a continued access study so that we can continue to treat these patients while we wait for this commercial approval. This device is self-expandable on a nitinol frame with porcine pericardial tissue. There are four valve sizes, 23, 26, 29, and 31. So this accommodates a native annulus that's 18 to 29 millimeters. The sheath size for this device is 18 French, and the access is iliofemoral, subclavian, or direct aortic approach. I'm going to just briefly talk about the two studies. The Partner US trial, this is the study that used the Edward Sapien device. There were two cohorts. There was the high risk surgical group, or cohort A, in which they compared the Edward Sapien TAVAR to surgical valve replacement. And then there was the inoperable cohort, cohort B, in which they compared the Edward Sapien TAVAR to standard medical therapy. And the findings were, in cohort A, that the TAVAR is non-inferior to surgical aortic valve replacement in terms of all-cause mortality. Symptom improvement was similar in both groups. At three years, the stroke rate was also similar in both groups. However, there is an increased risk of periprocedural neurologic events in the TAVAR.
Cohort B, Tavar compared with standard therapy, we saw a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, repeat hospitalizations, and improvement in cardiac symptoms in favor of the Tavar, and we see that this improvement continues out beyond three years. Again, despite that there was a higher incidence of stroke and vascular events. The core valve US pivotal trial, this was a study using the Medtronic core valve device. We participated in the study here at Sinai and we actually implanted the first Medtronic core valve in the United States. Again, there were two cohorts, the extreme risk, where they just underwent the TAVAR with the Medtronic core valve and there was the high risk surgical group in which we compared the Medtronic core valve TAVAR to surgical aortic valve replacement. And the one-year results have come out, and the high-risk study showed that at one year, the core valve achieved an all-cause mortality and major adverse cardiovascular and cerebral event rate that was significantly better when compared with surgery. Hemodynamic performance in the core valve was also better than surgery across all time points. And the stroke rates were not statistically different between the two groups. And this is the first study with a transcatheter heart valve that has shown superiority to surgery. The extreme risk study uh, supports the safety and efficacy of the TAVAR in those that are deemed unsuitable for surgical valve replacement, and it achieved its primary endpoint of a reduction in all-cause mortality as well as major stroke. So how do we determine if a patient is appropriate for this procedure? Um, they go undergo an extensive TAVAR evaluation. First and foremost is the echocardiogram, which qualifies the patient. They need to have a valve area that's less than 1 or 0.8 centimeters squared, depending on which device. Their mean gradient, more than 40, and or a peak velocity that's greater than 4. And again, we get all of these measurements from the echo. We do a CT angiogram of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. This gives us a measurement of their native aortic valve uh, diameter. It also um, looks at the aorta. It looks at the iliacs. It tells us what our access would be, and also if there's any anatomical contraindications to the TAVI, TAVAR. Uh, we do a right and left heart cath to assess for any clinically significant coronary disease and look at their hemodynamics. Pulmonary function test, carotid duplex. We assess their New York Heart Association functional class. They need to be symptomatic class two or greater. And they all have a consultation with one of our interventionalists on our TAVAR team. The next step is what is their surgical risk assessment? And this is performed by one of the cardiothoracic surgeons on our TAVAR team. Um, if the patient is determined to be low risk for surgery, they should be scheduled for a surgical aortic valve replacement. There is no data to support the TAVAR procedure in this risk population. Intermediate risk patients, this, this is a question that uh, this remains to be seen. There are current ongoing studies that are comparing the TAVAR to uh, intermediate risk to surgery in intermediate risk patients. And so uh, stay tuned for the answer to that. Um, but we do have data to support proceeding with the TAVAR procedure in patients that are considered to be high risk, meaning their predicted operative mortality or serious morbi morbidity would be more than 15% with surgical value replacement at 30 days, or the extreme risk or an operable patient in which their operative mortality or serious morbidity is greater than 50% at 30 days with surgery. So how do they make this assessment? They do the STS risk score, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons risk model, which calculates operative mortality and morbidity. Um, and, it, and it uses uh, certain patient demographics and clinical variables in or, order to determine this risk. Now, it's not all inclusive, so there are also incremental risk factors that are used. And the evaluation of these other clinical factors helps improve the prediction of what their mortality or mor morbidity would be undergoing surgery. So the STS risk includes things like age, height, and weight, if they've had a prior cardiothoracic surgery, an MI, or coronary disease, if they have other valvular abnormalities, uh, what their ejection fraction is in their New York Heart Association functional class, if they have arrhythmia, kidney disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease, peripheral artery disease, or a cerebral vascular disease. Some of the incremental risk factors that are considered that are not included in the STS risk score are patients that require home oxygen therapy, nocturnal BiPAP, patients with liver disease or anemia requiring uh, transfusion, 
patients with a hostile mediastinum or a porcelain aorta, which would preclude them from surgery, and also things like significant mobility impairment that would put them at a higher risk for complications if, if they underwent surgical replacement of the valve. So I'm going to present a case study. AM is an 84-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, coronary disease with a prior three-vessel cabbage in 2004. He had a non-STEMI and a drug-eluting stent to his circ lesion in 2012. He is known severe AS and both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. He has CKD stage 3, myelodysplastic syndrome and anemia, and bladder cancer that was treated with a resection. He's been experiencing progressive dyspnea on exertion at less than a block, dizziness, and fatigue over the last three months. So we bring him in for workup. His EF is 45%. On, this is his echo. He's found to actually have critical aortic stenosis with a valve area of 0.49. Peak and mean gradient is 58 over 41, and his velocity is 4.1. The CAT scan shows that his native aortic annulus is 28.5 millimeters. His sinus of val valsalva and annular perimeter are um, suitable for Tavar. And bilaterally, his femoral and iliac vessels are more than 9 millimeters. His cath shows two vessel disease, but his circ intervention site is patent and his grafts are patent. His carotid duplex shows that there's no uh, significant obstruction. Pulmonary function test was normal. And his EKG is a sinus rhythm with a right bundle branch block. And so this does put him at a higher risk for a conduction disturbance after the procedure. His surgical risk assessment, we find that his STS mortality is 7.6, and this includes his age, the prior cabbage, systolic dysfunction, his New York Heart Association functional class, the kidney disease, and the diabetes. The incremental risks that were considered was that he is frail, he had a prior cancer, and he has anemia that does require intermittent transfusion and procrit injections. And so the cardiothoracic surgeon determined that he was a high risk for a surgical valve replacement and his mortality risk would be more than 15% at 30 days with surgery. So now you have to ask the question, is the patient a candidate for the TAVAR? So number one, is he meeting the echo criteria? And the answer is yes. His valve area is 0.49, his mean gradient is above 40, and his velocity is above 4. Do we have a transcatheter heart valve that can accommodate his annulus? So the CAT scan showed his annulus is 28.5 millimeters. And as I pointed out earlier, the Edwards has sizes that can accommodate an annulus 18 to 25. So no, he wouldn't be a candidate for the Edwards. But core valve has sizes that can accommodate 18 to 29 millimeters. And so yes, he would be appropriate for a Medtronic core valve. What is his access? His femoral and iliacs were more than 9 millimeters, which we don't see all the time, a lot at all. <laughs> so he's uh, appropriate for percutaneous iliofemoral access. There were no anatomical contraindications seen on the CAT scan or the echo. And then the last question, is he a higher extreme risk for surgery? And the, the surgeon determined he was a high risk. So he was subsequently enrolled in the core valve high risk continued access study, underwent a successful implantation of a 31 millimeter core valve. It was percutaneous access and done under MAC, so no general anesthesia, no intubation. He did end up with complete heart block after the valve was placed, and so we put a permanent pacemaker in day one post Tavar, but otherwise progressed very well and was discharged by day three post Tavar. He has regular routine follow-up with his primary cardiologist. Uh, we saw him at 30 days and six months, and he's doing extremely well, and we will see him in September for his one-year visit. So in conclusion, the TAVAR is an alternative treatment for those with severe aortic stenosis that are considered to have a high or prohibitive risk for a surgical aortic valve replacement. We see marked valvular function improvement, immediate hemodynamic and clinical improvement. The results of the diagnostic workup and the surgical risk assessment is what determines if the TAVAR is appropriate. And in terms of all-cause mortality, when comparing the TAVAR to surgical aortic valve replacement in patients that are high risk for surgery, partner found non-inferiority, and the core valve US pivotal found superiority. Thank you for your time. Okay, so my questions. The TAVAR procedure is indicated for severe aortic stenosis in which of the following patients? A, low risk for surgical valve replacement. B, high risk for surgical valve replacement. C, extreme risk for a surgical valve replacement. Or D, both B and C. 
Oh, I don't have the music. <laughs> okay. Which of the following are essential in evaluating patient candidacy for the TAVA procedure? A, the echo, B, the CAT scan, C, the surgical risk assessment, or D, all of the above? All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.